Oh man, my head. Where am I? 16 years ago, a game titled SpongeBob's Truth or Square released for home consoles. Is this correct? What? Ah! 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 Yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who developed it? Uh, Heavy Iron Studios, best known for their previous two classic SpongeBob games. Where is the formula? What? Formula? Ah! God! Where's the formula in the game? If you can tell us, we can guarantee your safety. Alright. Alright. It all started back, as everything does, on the Nintendo Wii. SpongeBob's Truth or Square dropped on October 26, 2009 for home consoles. Developed by the classic Heavy Iron Studios, this ends the company's SpongeBob game trilogy. Starting from the legendary Battle for Bikini Bottom and followed up by the movie game, the third game had quite a reputation to live up to. Inspired by the infamous ratings trap of an episode of the same name, Truth or Square thankfully marches into a completely different direction from its origin. I played this game quite a bit as a kid, but never fully through. So what's the consensus on it? Well, since this is a YouTube video, there's only one way. A retrospective! Tomorrow is the 117th anniversary of the Krusty Krab, and to celebrate our favorite Sponge is throwing a party. Everyone's here, and Mr. Krabs shows up and gives Spongebob the Krabby Patty secret formula to hide, just in case Plankton shows up. Immediately following this, Spongebob forgets where he put the formula. Overwhelmed with despair, Spongebob frantically searches for the formula, but no dice. Thankfully, Plankton shows up and offers to help search for it out of the kindness of his heart. How nice. Plankton sends some kind of robot into Spongebob's memory to search for the formula and eventually dives in himself. Side note, this scene is already really weird. So we start at the party, move to the chum bug for the Plankton stuff, and we then wind back at the party. Now, you might think of this as a unique narrative device or an unreliable narrator trope, but no, it's just not really explained. Prepare for that a lot. The plot, as expected, is just the backdrop here. I'm not expecting a best-selling story, I'm just here for a 7 out of 10 platformer game. Welcome to the hub of this game, SpongeBob's Party. Unlike the previous games, you'll wind up back here after each level. There's some stuff to do, like upgrade random furniture, talk to characters, or just view concept art, but that's really about it. As you're gonna see, this game is basically just a greatest hits of Spongebob, not the album. My personal favorite thing here is this really random portrait of just a smug, outlined Spongebob. First thing to note, this game deserves an achievement for just recycling content. Basically every asset from the previous two games gets used here, like music, textures, and sounds. Honestly, the only major differences are the dialogue and unique currency, those being happiness points, or tokens, or whatever you want to call them. And as expected, we unfortunately do not get Clancy Brown to officially voice Krabs, but Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy will later retain their original voice actors, so that's nice at least. But screw all that, let's look at the first level. Welcome to Jellyfish Fields, our first memory. The general structure here is to flash back to classic Spongebob episodes to cheer our sponge up so he recalls the location of the formula. This one is all about season 1's jellyfishing, with some others sprinkled in. The graphics aren't amazing, and I was expecting that, but I gotta say, I actually really like the art style here. It's really nice to get to view the overall environment of the area, like the skybox or other stuff outside the boundary. Spongebob has a double jump and a spatula slam, quite a departure from the previous games, especially the movie game's fantastic upgrade system. Hey look, it's Kevin the Sea Cucumber. This is going to be the level of references you get. Fun little nods here and there, which are greatly appreciated. We get into combat with the main enemies of this game, Plankton's robots. All have the same style, just with some variation here and there. We easily wipe the floor with them and get a key to unlock a jar for platforming. Hey Gary, you are looking a bit, uh, more cubic than usual? Gary is here to give general advice on the level. We break a jar of jellyfish, likely inspired by Jellyfish Hunter, which is, in my opinion, a very underrated episode. There are some exploration-based elements found in every level, such as the Sleeping Patricks. We don't really know why they're here, and they don't really net you any kind of reward unless you're specifically playing the Xbox 360 version, which is just an achievement. Meet our next enemy, the Spinning Robots. I hate these guys with my heart and soul. I swear to you I'm not bad at 3D platformers, I do hold the world record for speedrunning Mario Odyssey at the moment, but the hitboxes here just feel off. We clear that area and get our first power up. Steroids! We get buff at the gym and get increased damage and the ability to destroy those little Squidward Tikis. They don't look like Squidward at all, but the game calls them that, so that's what I'm gonna go with. We clear the cave and see... Spongehenge? 
Hold on, when did this game come out again? Spongehenge came out in 2007. That's weird. This feels like a cursed site if I've ever seen one. And Larry too? Okay, future B-Tan here. Larry can offer you challenges for every level and actually adds a little bit of replay value to the game, but you can't get him on your first run through of every level. So we slide down and see some notable locations off in the distance. Is that the sea needle featured in like one episode? This game is really throwing me off here. And welcome our next power-up, Patrick wielding Sponge as a hammer. We end level 1 with collecting a jellyfishing net. Took around 15 minutes, surprisingly more than I expected. To be fair, I just did get done with Atlantis Square Pantis, whose horrible levels took like 5 minutes. Usually. Here we follow close to Season 1's Tea at the Tree Dome, but before that, I just want to highlight the surprisingly decent animation quality. Like, it's not outstanding, but the lip syncing is hooked up correctly, and as expected, the voice actors are giving it their all. SpongeBob lost the Krabby Patty secret formula, and now he's sad. And when he's sad, he can't remember anything, like where he put the formula. It's a vicious cycle. Does this make it any sense? We've got basically what you'd expect, Tom Kenny, Mr. Lawrence, and the rest. Minus one Mr. Krabs, though. Shazam? That's the best line we got here? During loading, we also get these little cute trivia questions. They're extremely easy and very simple. Like, look at the art. These are legit just generic designs, copy and pasted. Like, even I can get them relatively simple and recreate them. Here. It's weird, the game really likes to reference, which I'm fine with, but they just literally copy stuff. To my knowledge, this is the only Spongebob game that uses the show's actual background music. All the other games feature original songs, but here we get stuff like 12th Street Rag or Seaweed. It's just really interesting. Each level's thumbnail is also just a screenshot of the episode it's based on, and Spongebob's house paintings are just official art as well. Like, look at this! That's just from Club Spongebob, er... Wait, did they predict Spongebob meme culture? This one is literally just a joke that people share. I don't have any texture mods on or anything besides a 60 FPS patch, so that's in the original game. This is getting kind of creepy. I'm getting off topic. Back to the level, this is all about when Spongebob met Sandy. We find ourselves in Kelp Forest and even get a nice nod to the previously mentioned Club Spongebob. Also, we get introduced to the Spin Attack. Spongebob shifts into a kind of wheel and comprises our second move. We can use this to counter the spin robots earlier, but I prefer the spatula slam, honestly. We get introduced to a summoner type of robot and an invincible spiky guy, both of whom kind of suck. Hey, there's Club Squidward, complete with his little patchwork tent. Why does he need four pairs of tidy whiteies? Maybe some questions are actually better left unanswered. One of the few things I wrote in my notes for this level was how underutilized Kelp Forest is in most Spongebob games, and that just made me think of the Yellow Avenger since it is a Kelp Forest level, but eventually it just made me want a Spongebob-styled Metroidvania. Wouldn't that be cool? Like you unlock stuff like a Bubble Slam, or Patrick gets an ability where he can just spin and climb walls. Wishful thinking, but I still think it's a cool idea. Oh hey Sandy, what's up? Why? We find ourselves with these flowers. I detest these repulsive little creatures. The hit detection just feels wrong, and at the moment we have no way to destroy these nasty things. Speaking of hit detection, say hi to our newest actual enemy, a bigger hammer guy. He's not too bad. Also important to note, I apologize in advance for the camera in this game. It is really clunky. If it runs against a wall, you just cannot move it. It won't zoom in or quickly phase through, it just stands there. Menacingly! We beat him and find Sandy paying for assaulting that claim earlier. We also see this weird submarine thing in the water that totally won't be relevant later. Welp. Enter the first mini-boss of our memory-filled adventure. He is really simple, just wait for an opening and slam him. He only takes like three hits and then goes down. For this, we receive a jar of tea from the episode. You know what Spongebob once clarified was the happiest day of his life? getting into the salty spittoon. So what if we just recreate that? That should cheer him up. We do this, but make a bit of a tactical error in our usage of vocabulary. Remember what I said? You're going down, Tubby. Oh, oh, oh. 
Say your prayers. You're up against our first boss of the game, Robo Patrick. Wait, 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 wait. There's really no dodge or movement ability in this game besides jumping, so your positioning is key. I learned this the hard way. Pat cycles through a spin and slam maneuver, and your goal is to give him one sexy slap on the posterior. He throws some enemies your way, but your performance enhancing sponge narcotics will deal with him easily. Pat deploys some ice to change things up, but it doesn't really do anything. Why are you supporting him? After then slathering some jelly as well, we defeat Robo Patrick. He's pretty easy, all things considered. Before we exit the level, I just want to highlight the details of this level. We have the Sea Needle, Weenie Hut Juniors, the Magic Shop from Fun, and even the Ice Cream Stand run by the Anglerfish Lady in the first movie. All really cool details. For brutally murdering Patrick in cold blood, we acquire the, for some reason, Green Hot Dog. We jump into jellyfish fields for this level, not the crusty crab, which, you know, you would expect. They make it work, but it's just kind of odd to not be in basically one of the three locations from the episode. We get a new move, that being the cannon shot. SpongeBob loads up on water balloons and fires them, dealing damage but most of the time just used for puzzles. The main goal of this level is to feed anchovies on a bus to progress, which we do by firing into Krabby Patty launchers. This is an alright level. I do like the odd elements, such as this poor guy who has to paddle the entire bus forward. Between each section we ride the bus as it goes through a car wash and dodge the spinning stuff in scalding water. Also fun fact, don't fall in the water. It won't work out. About halfway through, we unlock another new mechanic. We get extremely hydrated and use water to grow sponge platforms or destroy nearby objects. This does require a nearby bathtub though, so we can't just use it whenever. We find a small arena of enemies and take a bit to defeat them, only to realize we actually missed a Squidward power-up. Squid acts as a cluster shot, firing bursts of three cannonballs. After some precarious platforming and tense timing, we make it to the end where we see the bargain mart. I don't think it's supposed to be in jellyfish fields, but you do you. This level wasn't bad, it just felt kind of blank in a way. Like I can see where the gameplay mechanics are being developed or, you know, we're adding in new mechanics, but so far this is just the weakest level here. For feeding like maybe 8 anchovies total as compared to the waves of them in the episode, we get the golden spatula. Not the hydrodynamic spatula with port and starboard attachments and with a turbo drive. I'm not gonna ask questions here, I'm just reviewing a Spongebob game, man. This is not getting me closer to my goal of you shutting up. Wait! I remember a certain jolly fellow that you and I had the pleasure of meeting one fateful night. <gasps> oh, you don't mean David Hasty. Santa! You might have noticed the near name drop of David Hasselhoff. It's actually really interesting since I'm not sure whether just his name counts under his likeness. For instance, in the PC version of the movie game, you never see his name nor face. I just thought that was cool to note. For the level, we wind up in the Krusty Krab's freezer, and I gotta be honest, this is a really cool setting. I don't think this journal area was used in any previous Heavy Iron Studios game, so it feels like a breath of fresh air. And depending on how long this video takes to make, this lines up with the holiday season. If you're watching this later, pause the video until December. That's the only time I permit you to watch this. Maybe it's just me, but I absolutely adore winter-themed levels in games, and this one is no exception. I just like looking at the background. It really does feel like an imagined and scaled up version of what the Krusty Krabs freezer is probably like. This might also be the only reference to the original special the game is based on, since one of the major plot points is getting trapped in a freezer and the episode originally had a title card for it instead of Truth or Square, but regardless, this is a cool area design. Pun intended. We get introduced to another new enemy, a bomb robot. These annoying heaps of scrap fire projectiles, and when destroyed they drop their heads as a time bomb. You can then jump on it and roll it around to explode other enemies or objects in the environment. Thankfully, this one controls fairly well. 
unlike something else similar. Now is probably a good time to talk about the dialogue. If there's one major flaw with this game so far, it is the atrocious cooldown for voice lines. SpongeBob repeats the same like 10 lines what feels like every single minute, and it just starts to get so grating. There are some funny bits though, such as... We roll the bomb bots and destroy ice walls and trek further until we see a nice little reference to Christmas Who. Continuing through some time stuff, we jump on boxes and even more boxes and hey, that's... That's the crusty sponge stuff, right? That's actually really interesting to be in here. I really don't remember there being that many references in this game. I'm honestly really liking the way they're handling this kind of stuff. They don't take center spotlight, but are there if you notice them. Similar to last time, we get a second new mechanic. Gum wads. Also again copying from Super Mario Galaxy, we shoot and swing off these wads to navigate perilous sections of the level. We find a laser grid area and the mashed potato hair lady for Christmas Who as well. This is fun and also has a bunch of frozen enemies at the top that nothing happens with. I think we enter the AC unit for the freezer and use gum wads to avoid getting crushed. Say hi to the tenderizer robot, our next mini boss. Being honest here, this guy sucks. He fires at you with projectiles and slams at you if you get close. The game does not tell you, however, that you need to bait two of these melee attacks before he shows his weak point. I took an embarrassing amount of time to do this before looking up a guide. We finally end up defeating that lackluster mini boss, and for saving Christmas, we grab Squidward's wooden clarinet. Welcome to the Murma Lair. Our goal is to reach Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. I think. The audio and dialogue for our superheroes is horribly mixed and at some points even compressed. Who is this Joker? I can't see too good. We don't need any cookies, little girl. Now shove off. I have no idea what they're saying half the time, and I don't think the game does either. We see our old duo of the hammer and swing robots, but with new paint jobs. These guys now take a whopping three hits to go down, and it is very frustrating. You'll also see Plankton following Spongebob through this level. I'm not really sure why, but an extra controller was being registered, so he's here, I guess. Plankton serves the role for co-op, and lets the other player do really basic stuff like stun or push enemies, perfect for you if you have a younger sibling, but you know, you don't really want them to play. Anyways, we see some silhouettes of our superheroes as we trek on. The lighting in this level is unique, and it's the only time darkness is actually really used as a gameplay mechanic. We platform and attack in the dark and also clip through a random platform for some reason. We clear out an arena of enemies frozen in tartar sauce like our favorite Man Ray, and platform past plenty of electric beams. I want to highlight. I love the different depictions of the Mermelayer and Spongebob. In the show, it's generally pretty small, but it has some basic rooms. Power Washing Simulator's DLC follows this, but other times we get this or Battle for Bikini Bottoms version, showing huge, empty, cavernous spaces. We then reach a platform of pure trap flowers and get to use the Sandy power-up, spinning into a ferocious tornado of pure destruction, and the only way to wipe these little suckers out. Doing so reveals buttons that let us progress, and get to see the IJLSA costumes. Speaking of costumes, there are multiple outfits you can wear in the game, but are of course purely cosmetic. You might have even noticed Spongebob or Patrick wearing different outfits earlier in this video. Each character only has about four though. Later we get to see the Orb of Confusion and get an interesting cutscene about it. I hope I'm not standing too close to the blue and black confused location, otherwise I might not make any sense my peanut butter tooth knuckle. After punching through some more robots, we get to see Prawn? Like, the guy from Battle for Bikini Bottom? SpongeBob doesn't even recognize him and just calls him a shrimp. According to the trivia section of this game, Prawn actually is found in the exact location he was defeated in at Battle for Bikini Bottom, which is a pretty nice touch, all things considered. We run through a final gauntlet of lasers and dropping platforms and fight multiple waves of robots right in front of our superheroes who just decide to not help. Thanks guys, for our efforts, we earn the Aquaphone. Just make sure not to overuse it. Release the bogus! Welcome to the Patty Vault. It's weird that we've now had two levels in the Krusty Krab, but not like the main dining area as you'd expect. I wonder if the second rendition of Jellyfish Fields was done super late in development, but no time for that. We've got to stop Squidward from eating too many patties before they go to his thighs and 
Oh, we're too late. Say hi to Squidbot, our second and main boss of the game. To my knowledge, there was a planned Squidward boss fight for Battle for Bikini Bottom, but it never made it super far, so it's cool to see a rendition of it here. This fight is about getting from one side of the arena to the other. We have to hit switches and try to bounce across sliding platforms. To stop us, Squidbot employs the greatest game mechanic yet terribly designed hitboxes. I swear I'm not terrible, but this arm cycle attack is so frustrating. In addition to this, he'll try and shoot at you with some clarinet notes. Nothing too difficult, just gotta use the gum wads to strike him in the face about three times and the fight's over. Easier said than done though. I actually died a few times on this fight. I think they just forgot to put a robot filter on Roger Bumpus's voice lines. Like, the Patrick robot had like a robot filter, but here it's just an impression. My time's all about to turn. My, my, my time's all about to turn. My, my. After a very frustrating 7 or so minutes, we finally emerge victorious and defeat this scrap metal squid. For exploding Squidward's thighs, we obtain just a Krabby Patty. Oh my god, there was something crunchy in my water. I never beat the Squidbot as a kid, so from here on out, everything's actually new to me. At this very restaurant, the hash slinging slasher used to be a fry cook. And every Tuesday night, his ghost returns. By the way, SpongeBob, it's your turn to take out the trash. As the title says, this level is based off of Graveyard Shift, and I gotta admit, this is just a really good level. Like, I'm actually having fun in this. This is not supposed to happen. Most Spongebob games are supposed to be so mediocre. Like, not actually decent. Following from earlier, this level actually doesn't take place in the Krusty Krab. Shocker, I know. Instead, comboing with Graveyard Shift and Rock Bottom. Like the Krusty Krab Freezer, I love the setting here. It's cool seeing a more dark and hazardous environment explored in a Spongebob game. Using the Rock Bottom theme from Battle for Bikini Bottom, it again fits really well here. After a quick intro, you actually enter a frogfish's body and navigate around. Quick note, what is with Spongebob and like venturing through creatures? It's happened multiple times in the show, movies, and games. Kinda weird if you ask me. Anyways, throughout this level, we see Squidward talk about the three signs of the hash slinging slasher. For some odd reason, his list is ordered incorrectly. Squid starts off with referencing the phone when it's supposed to be the second item, but this is more of a nitpick, honestly. We traverse around lovely stomach acid and come face to face with- Oh my god! What is that? We problem solve a bit more and eventually send the fish into cardiac arrest and break his teeth out. We now find ourselves at a much lower altitude of rock bottom, complete with magma and a fish from the first movie. So in every level there have been these funny skeletons scattered throughout just as a fun little environmental joke that I haven't mentioned, but in this one we find this guy. He's the only one with whatever calendar paper object this is. I got a bit creeped out here because I heard a weird moaning noise coming from it but discovered this was just a nearby hidden Patrick. Now we parkour through a thermal vent area, complete with a smoky fog, really adding to the atmosphere here. Squidward also states the final step for the hash slinging slasher. What's next? Mustard in the urinals? A plate of pickles? Ah! All right, maybe it's just the method I'm using to play this game, but the lighting is really nice. I love the blend of colors. It almost has like a bit of a neon light quality to it. We see the hash slinging slasher in all of his glory as well. I'd rather be jellyfishing. Hey, that'd make a good bumper sticker. I don't even know what to say for that one. We talk with Squidward a bit more and proceed to the final area, utterly drenched in lava. We maneuver a bomb rock and fight off others to find a button. I don't see what changed. Oh, we fight off one last wave of enemies and admire the cool visuals of the level for a bit and collect our treasure of a 24-7 open sign. Honestly, this level is just my favorite. It has good mechanics and a fun level design. Good job, Heavy Iron.
here is our penultimate level. Taking us back one last time to the kelp forest, we get a higher position than last time. We also get to see some unique buildings. Is that Master Udon? It is. Surprising to me, this level combines karate choppers and karate island of all things. Was not expecting that at all, but you know, I'll take it. That's pretty cool. It's nice to get a different perspective of Kelp Forest as well, compared to the lackluster second reprise of Jellyfish Fields. This level is basically just the last gameplay mechanical challenge, and the devs are going all out. This one is basically just a long gauntlet broken up with some simple timed elements here and there, and by this point, I was getting really tired of the camera. It is so annoying. It never led to any deaths, but it could have just been way better. We open up a pathway of boxes on a river and navigate farther down to free jellyfish to make some more platforms. We beat yet another enemy gauntlet and ride this cool boat, while fending off another enemy gauntlet. Hooray. There are these water balloon signs, but I wasn't fast enough to hit them and didn't really feel like going back because I've been playing Truth or Square for about four and a half hours by now and was very tired. We spend a very sad amount of time trying to get the buff power up but give up, which leads to the treehouse seen at the start. Say hi to our final mini boss. I detest this guy. He spins into walls and also does a circular pattern of cannon shots. Remember my comment about positioning being important since you can't really dodge? This really comes to a head here. I legit nearly died to this guy. None of the hints were really helping, but basically I think you gotta wait out a cycle and he will reveal a weak point which you can smack but I always traded for this, so I don't think I fought him the correct way at all, but a win's a win in my book. For completing the Dark Souls of Spongebob game bosses, we earn the Karate Gloves. Before we go retrieve the formula, we have some homework to do. SpongeBob's house features different upgradable furniture, but I discovered this doesn't really do anything. I replay through the first level to get a few more happiness objects to unlock the rest of the rooms and get to explore the kitchen and bathroom. I like the inside of the fridge, which has volcano sauce from karate choppers and a bottle with the Krusty Krab's condiment island image, featured, to my knowledge, only in Season 3's The Algae's Always Greener. <laughs> The bathroom doesn't feature anything of note besides the open 24 hour sign, which not sure why it's in here, but you know what, I don't live in a pineapple. My sense of decoration is a bit foreign here. This game also features cheat codes. Remember when console commands weren't super common? I actually used to have a huge paperback game cheat guide, and I still remember one section was about Super Mario Galaxy 2, and being able to infinitely flutter jump as Yoshi and bring him to the final battle. I never was able to pull it off, but I'm getting a bit distracted here. The cheats here are pretty basic, just more currency, unlock all outfits, concept art. There's also a black and white mode that just doesn't work for me at all, so that's nice. Let's check out the concept art for the game real quick. I would love to be able to view it at my own pace, but they all are just a part of this weird motion video. From what I can tell, it looks like they had variations of our spin and slam moves, such as using a bucket or a mop. There's some cool enemy design stuff as well, but I want to specifically note the third option. For the levels that have a third choice, it's just an odd Frankensteining of random Spongebob show assets. Take this one, just copied from My Pretty Seahorse, but Mystery is gone. Or this one from Your Shoes Untied, but it's missing the weird snake laces. Some of these don't even make sense. Like, look at this one. It's a kelp-filled blank title card with a stock art of Spongebob. I literally used this art for one of my iceberg thumbnails, and I'll legit recreate this for you here, right now. Give me a bit. I'm so confused. How does this relate to the game at all? What does this have to do with being truth or square? Like now it's just random art and random characters. I feel like I've stumbled onto the start of like an analog horror series. This is just from Survival of the Idiots. Uh, what does this have to do with anything? Like nothing's changed. It's just the quickster without any legs. Wh why? And in my opinion, the funniest thing to come out of this game this ominous screenshot from I Had an Accident. This literally feels like a meme template. This game has aged so oddly. It's so difficult to describe, man.
SpongeBob finally remembers where he left the formula, in the Krusty Krab safe. Revealing his horrible betrayal, Plankton ventures off to claim the formula for his own and converts the chum bucket into a mech. And I'm not gonna lie, this cutscene goes hard. Stay away from the tulips! Enter the final level. We have to keep up with the Plankto bot as a semi 2D auto scroller. He destroys buildings and stuff in the background and fires enemies, which we easily take out. We use the gum wads to infiltrate the robot and destroy batteries to damage the core. After this, we get thrown out. We repeat the whole process, this time with a few more dangerous elements and again, break the core. I fail to realize the robot has moved ahead and get stuck. I figure out what to do, get in and beat the core one last time. Being honest here, this was very lackluster. As I said earlier, I never got here as a kid, but just seeing the level title gave this super ominous feeling to me, so it's kinda sad to just not see it live up at all, but it is what it is. The ending cutscene then reveals the formula was never in the safe, it was in Spongebob's back pocket. Krabs then takes this and reveals that's his lottery ticket. The real formula was in Krabs' back pocket. Please take note of how the formula object is completely different in the two scenes it gets featured in. And that ends the game. Kind of abrupt, but this is pretty short. We get a pretty simple credit scene featuring like five repeated animations of Patrick and Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy whose dialogue, again, is so difficult to decipher. And that's it. No post credit scene or anything. So, from what you've just seen, it's pretty obvious this game is very underbaked. From what I've researched online, it seems Nick rushed the devs to get this out at the same time as the special. The other versions of this game have some extra content, like the handheld versions getting two bonus levels based off of Culture Shock and the Krusty Krab training video, but I've also heard the PSP port is just really bad, so... I might cover them in another video, but that's probably gonna be way later down the line. With most of our loose ends tied up, that marks the end of Truth or Square. So. What's my take on it? It's not bad, and it's probably important to note I've never actually played Battle for Bikini Bottom or the movie game, so this is the first actual experience to be set for me, which is honestly a good thing, since I'm 90% sure we can only go up from here. Would I recommend it? Um, only if you really don't have anything else to sink your teeth into. If you're a fan, go for it, but don't expect a 10 out of 10. More like a 6 or a 7 for me. Nothing bad, just nothing outstanding either. He never had the formula the entire time. Yeah, Krabs had it. Weird, huh? You have wasted so much of our time. What? There's no time left. We needed that formula. The operation's over. I'm closing this. Hey, wait, what? I, I did as you guys asked. Hey, wh what are you doing? You just gonna leave me here? I played through the entire game for you. Anybody there? Hello? 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 Do you want to subscribe to my Patreon?